Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar titled Equipping Your Foundation in the Age of Transparency and Big Data. This is the first of the three webinars in the Glass Pocket series. My name is Fung Kwok, and I'm the Senior Manager of, the members of Member Services at Northern California Grantmakers, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The series is organized with, with the Foundation Center and in partnership with our regional association colleagues, Southern California Grantmakers and San Diego Grantmakers. And we have members from all three of the regional associations on our call with us today. Um, I'd like to first thank the James Irvine Foundation for sponsorship of today's series, and a special thank you to Janet Camarina and Brad Smith at the Foundation Center for their thoughtful work on the development of this series. So what is Glass Pockets? It's an initiative created by the Foundation Center to encourage greater foundation transparency, to be more open in communications, and to help increase in the collective understanding of foundation transparency and accountability in the online world. You may remember the joint letter that was uh, signed by the three California Regional Association presidents that was emailed um, roughly last year at this time to foundations to participate in, the, in this initiative. The letter offered multiple ways to get engaged and equip your foundation in this age of transparency. If you want to learn more about this initiative, why it's important, and how you can participate, you can um, visit glasspockets.org. So today's webinar is focused specifically on the uh, big data. It's about recognizing that in this, this time of so much online transparency and information, that foundations cannot remain in information silos and work in isolation. Um, today's webinar will present how rev revolutionary changes in technology have fueled transparency. Increasing access to data will have profound and growing impacts on foundations and of all sizes. So it's very important issue, and we're really happy to have Foundation Center um, hosting this webinar today. There's going to be two more in this series on September 10th and October 17th, and I'll share more information about that later. And more information will also be coming to you later this summer. So um, in terms of logistics for today, please use the Q&A box on the bottom left corner to type in any questions and comments you have, and we'll um, answer those during the Q&A session at later at the end. You can also use that box to ask any tech-related questions about the webinar, and those will be answered also via text in, on the side left column. So um, I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Brad Smith, President of the Foundation Center. Brad has had an extensive and very impressive career in the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors. Prior to being at the Foundation Center, he was President of the Oak Foundation in Geneva, which is a major family foundation with programs and grants for 41 countries. He has served as a country representative in Brazil with the Ford Foundation and was promoted as vice president of the Ford Foundation, which he served for 10 years. In his role as VP, he was responsible for a large, largest program area, global peace and justice, and also supervised field operations in three continents and oversaw the creation of Trust Africa. Brad currently serves on the board of the Tinker Foundation and advisory board of the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. Uh, so without any further ado, let me just hand it over to Brad. Uh, today's talk is about big data and philanthropy. And when I wrote a blog piece on this a year ago, I asked the question whether or not foundations would indeed be able to enter the era of big data and really take advantage of it all it offered, or whether they'd be like Bart Simpson, Bart Simpson and being an underachiever and proud of it. Um, since writing that blog piece, uh, I've become more optimistic um, to the point where I do think now that there's enough going on in the world of foundations that we have a fighting chance of entering into the world of big data. But I think there's some things that foundations need to uh, stop doing and start doing uh, in order to take advantage of big data. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But first, let's talk a bit about what is big data. Um, basically, uh, data is ones and zeros. Uh, increasingly, everything in the world, except uh, you and me, is being digitized. Uh, and to the extent that it's digitized, it is capable of being manipulated by computers, um, increasingly sophisticated software programs, and search engines. Now, there are some very scary things that have been done with big data and are being done with big data. Um, a lot of you may have seen this story, but it's very indicative of the way big data is being used in the world. Uh, Target had been analyzing the search records of uh, people coming to its website and managed to identify a pattern that seemed to indicate that there was a segment 
of their audience that was most likely composed of pregnant women. And they began to do target marketing to that audience. And they got an irate letter from a father who claimed that Target was insulting the family by marketing to his teenage daughter um, as if she were pregnant. Um, it turned out, actually, in the end, that Target was right and the father was wrong. And he ended up writing uh, an apology letter to Target in which he said, um, obviously, there were some things going on in our household that we didn't know about. Uh, but Target did based on what this young woman was searching for on their website. Now, there are also some sort of frivolous things that we've done with big data. And um, this is an audience participation question. Um, you're looking at a chart. And it shows that it really peaks at spring break. And it peaks uh, again two weeks before Christmas. So I just wanted to ask any of you um, who haven't seen this before, if you have any guesses as to what uh, this graph might be tracking. OK, I see we have some people typing diets. Well, diets, sick leave. Um, Th these could be related, actually. Request a foundation. Remember, I said frivolous. And, and request to foundations are never frivolous, right? Sick leave, travel. Um, OK, I'm going to reveal what it is so we can move on. Uh, Facebook status updates breakups. Now, what's interesting about this, of course it's frivolous, but you, th you think of the scale of data that's available on Facebook. Somebody just grabbed relationship status and decided to market, track it against the calendar, and found some very interesting trends. And when you stop and think about it, it kind of makes sense, actually, the peaks and in, in the breakups in spring break and two weeks before Christmas. Now, we're also seeing uh, that data visualization is getting increasingly sophisticated. This uh, may look like modern art, but it actually is. It's a map of economic complexity that's been drawn by Cesar Hidalgo, who's a brilliant MIT professor. Uh, and they have studied huge data sets related to economic performance and have been able to figure out that the best predictor of continued and stable economic uh, development of a country is its economic complexity. This is actually a visualization of the economic complexity of South Korea. And Economies which are not complex have much lower growth prospects than those which are complex. Now, this is a map, actually, of uh, social networking. Now, it's certainly not my social network, but uh, this is just mapping all the interconnections between social networks. Um, but also, uh, let's look at big data a little bit in relation to philanthropy. Let's say that you were about to have a, a meeting with Congressman Javier Becerra in uh, the 30th Congressional District in California. I believe that is his district. Uh, and I remember once when I worked for the Ford Foundation, we had a, a congressman who was rather upset with the Ford Foundation. And we thought it would be a good idea before the meeting if we could figure out how much philanthropy was actually giving to organizations in his district. Now, at the time we did that, we didn't have databases like this. So we spent basically three weeks combing through our own grant records to try to figure out zip codes. And of course, it turned out we didn't have zip codes for a lot of the grantees. But here, with the press of a button, you can see that actually uh, over 1,000 foundations uh, have made grants in this district, uh, Javier Brazeo's district. And collectively, over the period of time shown on this map, have invested more than $537 million into, um, into his district. Or let's say that you were a, a new foundation uh, wanting to invest money in the, the metropolitan or Bay Area. And you wanted to get an idea of what other grant makers are doing, um, who they're funding. On this particular map, the green dots are all grant makers, and the red dots are foundations. Uh, this is, uh, you can see that there's a lot of philanthropic activity in, uh, in the Bay Area, as you suspect. And you could actually drill down in this map in different ways. And let's say you wanted to look at a particular part of the, of the Bay Area and wanted to actually look at a particular grantee, in this case, the San Geronimo uh, Valley Community Center. And you could keep drilling down further and see some information about 
that community center, links to its tax returns, uh, and actually see uh, what grant makers are supporting it. And interestingly enough, um, uh, several of the grant makers on this list, namely the Enterprise Holdings Foundation and uh, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving and the Vanguard Charitable Endowment, are actually from out of state. Um, big data uh, really arrived on the scene and in our lexicon uh, based on a 2011 study that was done by McKinsey. Uh, and the study was on the economic, uh, the potential contribution to the economy of big data uh, if it could be captured uh, if for different sectors. So what this chart you're looking at shows is on the left-hand axis, the vertical axis, the ease of capturing big data. And on the horizontal axis, its potential value um, to the economy. So if you look in the upper right-hand quadrant, for example, you can see that uh, capturing data for finance and insurance is relatively easy. Uh, and its data, its, its contribution to the economy is very high. Uh, con contrast that with government, and you can see that the potential value of government data to the economy is huge, but it's actually quite difficult to capture. Um, and that is because it's so siloed, it's broken into lots of different databases, although the, the open data movement uh, seems is making inroads on that. Now, what I found really interesting about this chart was that one very big industry, which is of great interest to us, of course, uh, is missing. And that is philanthropy. So, and I don't think McKinsey um, left it out on purpose. Um, I think maybe worse yet, they never stopped to think about philanthropy as an industry. So let's step back a bit and take a look uh, at philanthropy as an industry. Um, philanthropy as an industry is composed of over 81,000, almost 82,000 private independent foundations. Those nearly 82,000 foundations collectively uh, invest uh, on their asset side $662 billion in assets. Now, this is a tremendously uh, segmented industry. 76% of those 82,000 foundations have four staff or less. And in a survey that we did several years ago uh, of 11,000 foundations, a kind of representative sample uh, nationally, uh, Remarkably, 26% of foundations, only 26%, responded that they had websites or published annual reports. Now, that gets a little better when you're looking at uh, foundations with over $100 million in, uh, in assets. 69% uh, uh, of those foundations said they have websites. But that still means a lot of foundations don't have websites. So, you know, think about it, if you don't have a website, the chances that you're going to be taking advantage of uh, big data are probably quite remote. Now, let's also look at foundations in industry in terms of its advantages. Um, the first advantage of philanthropy is that it doesn't have to compete in the market. Okay? It's not selling, foundations aren't selling anything. So foundations are free from short-term market pressure. Foundations don't have to run for office. Uh, foundations do not have to chase votes, do not have to raise campaign finance, and again, are not subject to the, the short-term pressure of public opinion polling. Nor do foundations have to raise money. Now, obviously, community foundations, to a certain extent, need to raise money, but endowed private foundations do not have to raise money, and therefore they're not subject to the market pressure, if you will, of fundraising. So that gives foundations uh, tremendous benefits. And what are some of those advantages? The first is that foundations are free to take risks and, most importantly, support organizations and individuals that are taking risk. Uh, foundations can stick with issues 
for the long run. Um, because foundations do not have a lot of short-term pressure, they can really invest in issues and causes in organizations over the long haul. And foundations can invest in ideas. Um, although there is a lot of pressure to show results and have impact, uh, foundations still can sometimes just invest in someone or, or some organization that just has a kind of wild idea that needs to be tested. So these um, freedoms and these well, we can look at it as sort of defects and virtues. And I like to look at it as foundations having um, the defects of their virtues. So what are some of the, 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 the pros and cons when it comes to foundations? And now I'm going to turn to what I think foundations need to stop doing to take advantage of big data and what they need to start doing. So the first thing is that foundations need to stop trying to be unique. Um, there's no law that says the foundations have to be unique. We know the reasons they often are because they're, they're founded by very strong-minded, wealthy, successful individuals or, or heirs uh, and who often do feel that they have the right approach and are unique in many ways. But there's no reason that foundations have to be unique. And that the, the tendency for foundations to think of themselves individually as being unique um, causes some problems and gives foundations some disadvantages when it comes to harnessing data, particularly big data. Um, that means that our community of foundations are very fragmented uh, with lots of individualized institutions that behave in individual ways. And because of that, when it comes to data and information about what we're doing and information about our grants and our programs, we've sort of created the biblical Tower of Babel. Um, if you think about 82,000 82, foundations, each thinking up, um, describing its projects, their projects in their own ways, describing their programs in their own ways, their initiatives in their own ways, um, that can lead to a lot of different languages being spoken by foundations. And though we th often talk about philanthropy as a field, um, I find this image to be perhaps more appropriate. It's more like an archipelago. Think of Indonesia, with, which is a nation composed of 17,000 islands. It is a nation. We are all foundations, but we tend to be endowed, speak our own language, and are often far too isolated from each other, especially in an era of collaboration and data sharing. So this leads me to the second thing that foundations need to stop doing, and that is to stop developing custom grants management systems. Um, now, many of the big foundations and even some smaller foundations uh, many years ago had to develop their own systems because uh, there wasn't really much on the market in terms of commercial foundation grants management software. Uh, now, this is a Rube Goldberg device. Uh, it's kind of fun, actually, to to see this device. Uh, the guy here, he, he steps on this little lever. It sends the ball up to this scale on in the left-hand corner. Um, the scale tips, and it turns on the fan. And the fan blows the carrot over to the rabbit. The rabbit starts running, pushes the candle, number five, over to the string, burns the string, and it drops the fish, number seven, into the fishbowl. And the cat runs to grab the fish and turns on the television. So when you think about custom grants management systems, um, or any grants management system, historically, the purpose of those systems within foundations was basically to produce a check. Um, a grant proposal came into the foundation. It was processed in different ways internally, uh, went for approval to the board or to the executive or both. And then at the end of the process, a payment was made to the grantee, and the payment was tracked and together with the grantee's reports. But today, uh, there are lots of options out there on the market. The, uh, the grants management software is getting better and better. These are just, uh, these are the leading companies here, actually, but there are, there are other programs out there. And what we're seeing is that grants management software programs are beginning to be transformed into workplaces. So, 
Um, what do I mean by that? This is a screenshot of Flux. Um, some of you, I, I think, on this call may be using Flux or have looked at it. Flux is an uh, open source grants management program. Uh, and you can see that uh, Flux is pulling in plugins from other software packages uh, that really make it possible for the grants manager or the program officer or others to do a lot of the work they have to do without ever leaving the grants management program. So you can see that Google Maps are pulled into here. Google Drive has been pulled into here. If you're planning a trip and you want to go visit your grantees, um, GuideStar has been pulled in here in the form of charity check. Uh, so you can check uh, whether a 501c3 has its tax exempt letter from the, from the uh, IRS. And there's even some uh, foundation center information here, which we'll see more of in the next slide. Uh, this is another uh, software provider, especially for a lot of medium-sized foundations and uh, community foundations called Foundant, based in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, and Foundant is now integrating a series of APIs. As you, see, you also see Charity Check here from GuideStar, but also from the foundation center. So here you're seeing a little foundation center icon pop up. And if you click that icon, uh, what you'll get actually is a pop-up window that shows what other foundations are funding, in this case, a fictitious grantee's Jimmy Soup Kitchen. Uh, when I was a program officer, I was always required to, in each grant recommendation, to show who else was funding, uh, what other foundations were funding a uh, uh, potential recipient. And the way I got that information was not to search a database, but I called the grantee and asked them who else was supporting them. Today, you can get it in a pop-up window without ever leaving your own grant uh, management program. And let's say you were curious about some of those foundations that you saw that were also supporting Jimmy Soup Kitchen, and you may not have heard of, for example, the ABC Foundation. Well, you could keep clicking, and you could get a little prop pop-up profile with basic information and contact information about that foundation in case you want to get in touch with them. Uh, a third thing that foundations need to stop doing uh, is that to stop treating data and communications as two separate things. Uh, in large staff foundations, historically, uh, people that deal with data and information and archiving are usually in some other division, um, not the communications division. But this has a lot to do with the communications function in foundations. Uh, uh, by and large, foundations came late to communications. And the foundations that did start to add a communications function, at least in its first iteration, it, the basic job of the communications person was to write speeches for the president. But today, foundations are blogging um, more and more. Um, they're tweeting um, that we see many foundations on YouTube. And in an era where social media is being used both to learn about foundations as well as to broadcast information about foundations, it's really important that the data uh, backs the messages and that the messages are backed by the foundation's data. This is just an example of something the Foundation Center developed uh, at the request of the Conrad Hilton Foundation and a group of other foundations that fund something called WASH. WASH stands for Water Access, Sanitation, and Hygiene. Uh, 900, people, 900 million people in the world do not have access to safe water. And a group of funders wanted to be able to better understand what each other's doing as well as what the big government aid programs are doing to fund water access, sanitation, and hygiene around the world. So we built a data-driven uh, website, basically. This is a mapping application you're looking at. But even when we produced a research report, actually a printed research report uh, on WASH, uh, we, we didn't produce it the way the Foundation Center used to produce research reports, which was sort of a thick telephone book, sort of encyclopedia encyclopedic type report, which frankly nobody reads anymore. We used a much lighter approach with a lot of images, a lot of data driving it. And we found that this kind of information communicates messages much more strongly about what foundations are doing in the world than a lot of heavy narrative text. Uh, and it takes a lot of data 
to really tell the story of foundations work and impact. So just on this, this slide shows you the different data sources that we pulled on in order to produce a website for WASH funders and to tell the world about what foundations are doing on water access, sanitation, and hygiene. So you see there's grants data, there's 990 data, there's outcome data, there's social media data, there's geographic information system data. There's just lots of data sources go into telling this story. Um, there's a similar site which was just launched that people might want to take a look at actually uh, face, uh, features the work of the California Endowment and a number of other foundations uh, in California and across the country that are working specifically on black male achievement. But again, this is a, a way of, show, of bringing data to show what foundations are doing in the world and then data pulled from non-foundation sources to situate foundation work. Now let's go to what foundations can start doing. Um, the first thing we've got to do as a field is we've got to get beyond the 990 PF. Now, we all know and love the 990 PF. Um, we all fill it out every year as members of the foundation community. It is our basic accountability document for government, for the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, and a lot of you may know this, but just in case, um, regardless of whether or not you fill this document out, uh, in pen or in pencil, and believe it or not, some of them are still done in pencil, or electronically, uh, they all go to the IRS, and then the IRS converts them, even the electronic ones, into image files called TIFF files. And they're provided uh, at, on request to organizations that request them. The Foundation Center every year buys them from the Internal Revenue Service for a, sort of a nominal fee. And every month we get huge shipments of DVD ROMs with image files of all these 990 PFs. Uh, we have to then convert them into uh, PDF documents and then manually key in data before we can start to manipulate the data. Uh, so what that means is that there's a time lag between the time that it takes you to finish your year, the time it takes you to file your 990, which is up to a year after the close of a fiscal year, the time it takes for the IRS to convert these into image files, the time it takes for them to send them to us and to GuideStar and others, and then the time it takes us to pull data from those. So working with 990s is a bit like this. Um, it sometimes you can feel like we're still medieval monks in the scriptorium. But the, the, the serious consequence for our field is that it means that we are a $660 billion industry that relies on trend data that can be several years old. So what are some of the ways to get around that? Well, one way is, um, with specifically with foundation grants data, is something the Foundation Center has done for a number of years now, which is to encourage foundations to report their grants data to us electronically. Uh, this is done by uh, relationships with the software providers. I showed you before the grants management software providers like GIFs, uh, Foundant, Flux, and others, where they have built export modules into their programs which allow foundations essentially to export their grants data to us so we don't have to wait to get it uh, sometimes years later from a 990 tax return. Uh, and even if foundations don't want to do that, um, some foundations have actually said that they prefer uh, to have a time lag between um, the time when they finish their year and when people actually get information out of their 990s. Well, the 990s are becoming available. Um, there are two organizations which have made them as available in bulk as PDFs. One is publicresource.org, uh, the other is ProPublica, and the President's new budget uh, has in it a provision that would require all foundations and all nonprofits to file their 990 tax returns digitally and for the Internal Revenue Service to turn those around and make them available as digital, open, machine-readable data in a timely fashion. Now, nobody can predict um, what the budget process will be like, when that will be approved, what the phase-in period for this will be, but I can tell you from the Foundation Center's perspective, we are assuming that the bulk of the 990 data will be available as machine-readable open data, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit later, um, within uh, 
within probably two to five years. Okay, another thing that foundations need to start doing is aligning your data with the outside world. Uh, I hear lots of foundations say that they're going to start a, pro uh, a process to code their grants or they're going to change their coding system or maybe they've just uh, gone through a long process to change their coding system and this is never easy in a foundation. It's, it's difficult to get people within a foundation to agree on subject codes, for example, or beneficiary codes or geographic codes. and. Uh, I think the really important thing is before you sort of go too far down that path on creating a coding system is think about the program areas you work in and then look at how the data is already being arrayed in other sectors with which you would like to collaborate perhaps health data it could be international development data it could be youth employment data and look at that to see how you should best align your data because ultimately you're going to want to see your data in relation to other people's data. So there are lots of standards out there. The Foundation Center, the GuideStar, GuideStar and National Center for Charitable Statistics all use a, a similar data structure which is based on the, uh, the, the national, um, the, the tax exempt entity codes for the IRS. Uh, there's, if you're doing international uh, work, you may want to look at the Organization for Economic and Cooperation Development Database, or you might want to look at something new called the International Aid Transparency Initiative. Now, I also want to uh, show you some other things here, which one is GeoTree. This is a geographic data system, um, data standard developed by the Foundation Center that a number of foundations are using to show the, uh, the geographic focus of grants all according to a uniform geographic standard. So we all sort of don't invent our own description for the world. Now, um, I want to flash a number on the screen and ask you if anybody, any, anybody here can have a guess of what does 251 refer to? What, what's, what's that magic number? Two hundred and fifty one. What could two hundred and fifty one relate to when it comes to philanthropy? Okay, everybody's stumped, so I'm gonna go ahead and answer that one. Taxonomy. Okay, yes, it is taxonomy. Um what this is specifically is that the Foundation Center, um, we look for patterns in data so we can build programs to automatically code it. Uh and this was actually we looked at hundred and sixty thousand foundation grants. And we found 251 distinct ways that foundations describe general operating support. So here's just one example of this uh, for unrestricted funds for operational development. So we could save ourselves a lot of time if we could just agree on some standard ways of describing things. Uh, foundations want to know uh, about other foundations giving general operating support to benchmark their, their own operations and nonprofits really want to know how many foundations are providing general operating support. But even answering a simple question like how much general operating support is given by foundations has to first require figuring out all the different ways that foundations describe general operating support and then developing a way to pull all those together. And then the last uh, thing that foundations need to start thinking about is uh, start thinking about your data as open. I mentioned open data earlier. Um, open data is something that is uh, becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, when you think about it, there are three large sources of information coming into foundations. One is grant applications. Uh, the second is obviously the reports you get back on all the grants that you fund, the reports from grantees. And then there are publications. This happens to be a publication that was actually um, funded by the Wallace Foundation in New York. Could be the Irvine Foundation, could be lots of different foundations. But all these are increasingly coming into you uh, in digital form. And to the extent that they're online and they're ones and zeros, um, it a lot can be done with them. Now the traditional consumers of this information within foundations have been the foundation staff. But increasingly through search engines, through websites, through lots of different ways, uh, people are consuming your data and whether you actually know it or not. Uh, and 
people are going to find out about what you're doing. They want to find out about what you're doing. And uh, it is important that foundations sort of get ahead of the curve by telling their own story with data. And there are some really promising efforts uh, in this regard. One is the reporting initiative, which is on Glass Pockets, some, a site you heard about at the beginning of this webinar. This is an effort by 16 of the largest foundations uh, in the country and one very small foundation, actually, the VNA Foundation, to, which have agreed to report their data quarterly, at least quarterly, to the Foundation Center uh, as open machine readable data and to code it according to a common geographic standard. I flashed a geographic standard by uh, in, a, in a few slides ago. The importance of this is that this gets completely around the 990. Uh, this data is available open and free uh, on an interface which allows people to search it. Uh, and because it's machine readable, it also means that anyone can construct a query on this site. Uh, maybe they want to know about funding for Africa for a certain year or by a certain subset of foundations. They can construct that query and then they can download the data and if they have the skills, they can actually grab the data and mash it up in whatever way they want to. Now, I mentioned the VNA Foundation. The VNA Foundation is a very small foundation with about $50 million in assets in Chicago. They decided to join this because they felt that it was important for their foundation to be participating in an initiative to make foundation grants data more open. And they also wanted to show that this is not just something for large foundations. This is something for small foundations as well. Uh, MicroEdge, uh, which makes GIFs, which a lot of you use, uh, the most, the market leading uh, grants management software, has actually built into its online version the ability for foundations now to export or publish their own data as open, open machine readable data. I'm talking about the grants data here. And then another kind of open data, something you're going to hear about in another webinar in this series. Uh, foundations are not just ATM machines, they're not just sources of grants, they're sources of knowledge. Um, any of us who have worked in foundations, I mean, I certainly felt this. I often felt as a program officer I had a better overview, sort of bird's eye view of who was working on an issue and what they were doing than maybe any individual organization working in the field might have had. So. Uh, this knowledge of foundations, though, oftentimes that comes in through reports, uh, case studies, lessons learned, best practice publications, many times grantee publications funded by foundations, is not really centralized in any way. Um, some foundations have knowledge centers on their websites, but that's a very small number of foundations. So Issue Lab uh, is an effort uh, by a nonprofit which has now become part of the Foundation Center, so this is now a service of the Foundation Center, to produce an online archive of publications and research of foundations um, of the nonprofit sector and funded by foundations. And uh, this is all indexed in a way so that you can search it by subject, by author, by geography, by topic, so that when there's hot issues like the current debate on immigration policy, it's possible to pull a subset of these reports and show what the sector really knows and what the sector has learned about uh, immigration. In this case, uh, how uh, children's families and communities are impacted by immigration, immigration policy. And Issue Lab is also built in an interconnected way so that this is an example of a, a knowledge center that was built by Issue Lab, by the, by the Foundation Center for the Heron Foundation. So the Heron Foundation has a place on its website where anybody can come and search their own reports. Uh, because they're connected to Issue Lab, they can pull any reports from the more than 13,000 publications in Issue Lab. And anytime Heron adds anything, it gets uh, automatically added to Issue Lab. And Issue Lab in turn is connected to WorldCat, which is the worldwide system of 10,000 libraries, to Wiser Earth, which is an online community of environmental activists, and to things like WASH funders and other sites. So all this knowledge is being circulated and reused. 
And then there are demographic mapping tools that are taking advantage of, of big data. Uh, this is a tool which uh, the Foundation Center is mocking up, which basically allows people to uh, draw uh, freeform shapes on geographic maps and pull data um, related to income, to, uh, to uh, infrastructure to literally thousands of other data sets uh, as a way to do program planning. And then there's Markets for Good, an effort of the Gates and Hewlett and other foundations to sort of create a common commons for social sector data. Now, I want to leave you with two cautions uh, about data. The first is when it comes to data and foundations, uh, you need to avoid being a glutton. And what I mean by that is that the way that uh, data works is that the way, if you're going to get data and use data, you need to give data. You literally need to be part of the matrix to take advantage of big data. Uh, there's lots of big data sources out there, but data flow is very much a two-way street, especially open data. Uh, and there's a lot of data that you can access if you are willing to grant access uh, to some of, of your own data. The second uh, is caution, has to do um, with uh, collecting data within foundations. Uh, when I go to foundations the most today, the most common thing that happens is somebody points to the file cabinets and they say, uh, these won't be here because we're moving everything to the cloud or we're going to digitize everything. Or else people point to an empty space along the wall and they say, this is where the file cabinets used to be. So we're beginning to get weaned from paper files. Uh, but so what's happening with all the information? Well, it's going on to hard drives and the hard drives are more and more moving to the cloud. So all this information is sort of going away. But that doesn't mean that we know what to do with it. Uh, and the most sort of common, I think, error foundations can make and is that rather than pick the things that they need to know about, they feel they need to collect data on everything they do or on every program or every related piece of information around it. That's simply just too big a task. So I always like to think about what uh, actually Pablo Picasso said. This is attributed to him. It's a quote. He wasn't actually talking about computers. Um, he was talking about what were then the big new machine, which were essentially calculators, especially sort of the sophisticated calculators. And he said that computers are useless. They can only give you answers. So I think a really important thing for foundations to remember about data is that you're still not exempted from the hardest part of the task, which is knowing what questions to ask. So before you go out and collect data, figure out what questions it is you're trying to answer so that you won't um, misuse the resources of the foundation or overly burden the foundation or just as important not overburden your grantees by asking them for all sorts of information that you don't necessarily have the capacity or the strategy for using. So summing up here, uh, what do foundations need to stop doing to take advantage of big data? They need to stop trying to be unique, stop developing custom grants management systems, stop treating data and communications as separate, and start aligning your data with the outside world, going beyond the 990 PF, thinking about your data as open. And then two cautions. Those are, you have to think about giving data to get data, being in the matrix, and before you set everybody off, including your grantees, on a wild goose chase chasing data, Get your questions right. Get your questions right first. So I think we still have some time left for questions and comments, and I'd be glad to uh, answer anything anybody might have to ask. Thank you, Brad. And for those of you who have questions, you can um, te uh, type it in at the bottom left column or corner there, and it'll appear on the left column.
I did see a question come up from Ruth when you were talking about MicroEdge uh, exporting data. Yeah. Is that exported to the Education Center? Or if not, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it goes to, it's basically, it's an export function uh, to export the data to the Foundation Center. Uh, it essentially, it, it makes it, 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 it's a printout which puts it in a CSV file, which is the file format for Excel, and then can be sent to the Foundation Center. It's not, um, it's not something automatic that sort of grabs it. You have to, you actually have to press a button to export it. But the purpose of it is to export to the Foundation Center. And I think the, the interesting thing here is, you know, we're now working with MicroEdge and others so that foundations, uh, we do two things. Foundations that export their data to us in that way through GIFs or some other program, we send back to the foundations that same grant information on interactive maps and charts for your own use. But we're also now beginning to work with these software providers so that you'll be able to access the foundation center data, not just on your own foundations, but on everybody else's foundations to see who else is co-funding the, the organizations that you're thinking of funding. So I'm seeing the Q&A box now, so I can uh, address the next yeah. question. So the next question is from Sean, and it says, when it comes to measuring impact, what are examples of common languages that foundations can speak and model? Yeah, yeah the impact is the holy grail. Um, it's the hardest thing to measure, obviously. I don't need to tell any, any of you that. Uh, it's the hardest thing to get good data on. We. Uh, actually don't get that much impact data from foundations. Uh, we find quite a bit of it through Issue Lab, actually through reports and studies and evaluations and best practices. There are some efforts uh, out there. There's a Center for What Works, if you want to look that up, um, that has is trying to develop some sort of standardized uh, sort of standardized language and reporting criteria for impact. There is a effort of GuideStar and the uh, independent, sec uh, independent sector to get nonprofits to sort of upload information on four common impact questions. Uh, but part of the difficulty is that the, the questions coming from the foundations are all over the map and so different that it's very difficult to develop a standardized uh, reporting language that captures the nuance. I mean, this is the the bold frontier. Uh, our approach to it is to just collect as much information as we can from foundations, and much the way is I mentioned before with the 251 flavors of of uh, general operating support. See if we can begin to tease out of that some standardized impact language and sort of data structure or taxonomy. Thank you. The next question is from Barrett. Sorry if I messed that um, Is the VNA Foundation hoping to inspire other small foundations to join the Glass Pockets Initiative, and are others considering joining? Yes. Yes, they are, actually. Uh, the, the VNA Foundation, when they joined the, the, the reporting commitment on Glass Pockets, uh, if you go to Glass Pockets, there's a, a, a blog called Transparency Talk, and the president of the VNA Foundation wrote uh, about their experience and saying exactly that. He wanted to show that this was not just something for the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Annenberg Foundation, the Moore Foundation, that small foundations could and should be doing this. So he definitely uh, helped to uh, inspire them. And there are a number of other foundations. The It's not as easy uh, to actually do this uh, as even the big foundations found because one of the things they agreed to do was to code their grants for the not just the geographic location of the recipient, because that's easy, but the geographic focus of the work. And according to this common standard called GeoTree, which has uh, been developed by the Foundation Center, they found that was difficult. They also found that converting their data into the machine-readable form uh, was not as uh, that easy, or they didn't know how to do it. So we actually offer 
any foundation that wants to become part of this, we will do the conversion for them. As long as they can give us the grants data in an Excel spreadsheet, we will convert it to the open format. Okay, the next question is from Frida. How do we digitize the reports from our grantees so that it can be used both internally and externally? Well, if they're, it depends how they come into you. I mean, they're, if they're coming into you uh, as, um, to, if they're, if they're coming to you online, they are digitized. And uh, what Issue Lab has been doing, and I think it'll be really interesting when the Issue Lab webinar happens, I think it's in September, um, they're going to talk about this quite a bit. Uh, they're actually experimenting with both human assisted and machine for uh, for culling findings out of uh, the reports of grantees. Now, th the one caveat I'll have here is that, you know, one of the issues we all need to be careful about is that Issue Lab is, is dealing primarily with public, uh, published reports. So those are copyrighted in some way and they're in the public domain. Uh, grantee reports, there's a lot of c complex issues around uh, confidentiality that need to be taken care of. And that's a a matter for foundations to really be careful about in terms of what they're going to make available that's in those reports uh, and what they're not. Okay, so I think we have time for maybe two more questions. The next yeah. one's from Gabby. There's a misconception and maybe even mistrust that opening up our data will expose us to some sort of risk. Is there any downsi downsides in opening up this information? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, th there's, uh, I, you know, it would be wrong to say there's no risk, but I, I think there's a risk in not opening yourself up in today's world because institutions which serve the public good, and as foundations do, uh, are increasingly under pressure to reveal more about themselves. People just want to know more about them, whether it's the church or corporate social responsibility, government, anybody who is proposing to do good in the world is being Googled, is being searched, and with the tax returns of foundations uh, increasingly moving towards becoming open data, uh, people will be finding out more about you, uh, whether you want them to or not. So I think there's actually some downside to sort of acting as if you're hiding something. Um, this has historically always been the suspicion of foundations, especially during tense political or stressful economic times. You know, the Foundation Center itself was created during McCarthyism when foundations were suspected of supporting un-American activities. And actually, the Foundation Center was created as a public information service to, to make it much more easy for the public to understand what foundations are doing. And that's where the name Glass Pockets come from. It, it comes from congressional testimony in 1952 when a foundation uh, board chair actually told his congressional inquirers that he thought the foundation should have glass pockets. Okay, so from Shana, we have um, slightly unrelated. Have you <laughs> created reporting tools to make the reporting process more transparent and easy for grantees? such as online templates? Yeah, well, there's an interesting, um, there's a report which maybe we can post on here or, or make available to uh, through the, 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 our, our partners at regional associations. The, the, for its own fundraising, the Foundation Center filled out uh, over 80 online applications, online reporting forms uh, last year. And a foundation that was considering moving to online systems ask us if we could do a uh, sort of a, a survey of those. So we sampled 60 online applications and online reporting forms, and we described them in terms of the most frequently requested and the most, uh, you know, the least frequently requested information on all those forms from the perspective of a grant seeker and also uh, looking at sort of what some of the, you know, worst features were in the best others because the programmers build all sorts of tricky things into these like character limits and there are some where you actually you you finish the whole process the whole reporting process and then you can't download what you, what you as a grantee have proposed to the foundation um, you can't use back you know backspaces I mean there's all these sort of things that are built in so that report is a real sort of objective report about you know what what's good about these things what's not so good about them and the variations that are out there Okay, um, I think 
if we can do one more question really quick yeah. Um, yeah. from Barrett. I wanted to ask right questions. Want to ask the right questions of their grantees in ways that means the glass pockets best practices hurdle. Is the report you are citing the best practice to start? What are other resources recommended? Sorry, I don't think I can capture that right. No, I don't think I got that. I'm sorry. Could you? Yeah, I got. I I'm not seeing the full question on my screen. Hang on. Neither am I. Foundations. Okay, hang on. It keeps disappearing on me. Okay, I want to ask the right questions to the grantees in a way that meets the glass pockets best practice. Yeah, I got it. In, in foundations with 50 million in assets who want to ask the right questions to their grantees in a way that meets the glass pockets best practices hurdles. Is the reporting you are citing the best practice way, best place to start? What are other resources that you would recommend? Yeah, I, the the again the, the glass pockets uh, best practices hurdle. I mean, it's it's meant it's not a scoring, it's not a rating mechanism. You know, this isn't Wine Spectator, uh, it's not Charity Navigator. Um, we pulled these criteria for online transparency from existing practices of, of foundations. And the way it's set up in all those profiles is basically for each foundation you can click on where there's a looking glass for say like you know making uh, you know performance reports available for example and you can actually go to that part of their website and see what they're doing so you know we're not trying to pass judgment we're trying to help make foundation practice for this you know what I described as an archipelago more transparent for the sector so foundations it's easier for foundations to learn from each other Okay, there's also a lot in the Q&A, there are a lot of thank yous, and this is hugely helpful, and I just okay. want to reiterate because it's been really informative, and um, we are out of time, but I do want to let you know the two upcoming webinars, it's on your screen right now, September 10th and October 17th, also at 11 a.m., and it'll be featuring uh, Gabby Fitz, co-founder of Issue Lab, and the second will be uh, Jerem Bevan, Digital Strategy and Emerging Media Manager at Foundation Center. Um, so thank you so much to Brad for this very interactive and uh, just visually uh, engaging slides and your presentation. This is all going to be available um, to you, uh, emailed to your on the um, your program page website, the audio and the visual. Um, you'll also soon be receiving an evaluation form by email, so please take a moment to fill that out so we can get feedback for the next two webinars as well. And uh, yeah, look look in your emails this summer for program details and registration for the other two. So thank you so much to Brad and Janet and the Foundation Center team for this very rich content today. Thank you to all of you for your questions and, and listening and taking time from your busy schedule this morning. And uh, we really appreciate this and helping to push foundations to be better. Thank you, Brad. Okay, and it's always a pleasure for a California audience. I was born in Oakland, so um, it's great <laughs> to be talking to Californians. <laughs> great. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Monday, everyone. Okay. Thank you.